please join me in welcoming Mr. Walter Isaacson. Thank you, thank you so very much. Welcome. Thanks. And I really want to thank Dan and Joanna and the Foreign Policy Association. I've been to many of these lectures, and uh, it's a great association and a great lecture series, and I'm very honored to be a part of it. I have a speech here that I prepared because Joanna actually uh, asked me if I would speak on the mathematical tensor calculus underlying general relativity. So... But having talked to some of you in the crowd, instead of doing that, if Joanna doesn't mind, I want to talk about imagination and creativity and why Einstein's great leaps were not great leaps of science or great leaps of math, but also great leaps of the imagination. Those of us who study diplomacy, those of us who you know, love Shakespeare or uh, Picasso or go to MoMA or... Uh, go to symphonies. We love the notion of creativity, but we don't think that math and science is as creative, unless, of course, we're scientists. One of the joys I had in writing about Albert Einstein was to just see how imagination and creativity are part of the scientific process, especially when it comes to Einstein. Now, the good news for those of you who are intimidated a little bit by the notion of Einstein is that Einstein was no Einstein when he was a kid. He was very slow in learning how to talk, so slow that when he was growing up in Germany, his nickname in the family was De Deperte, the dopey one in the family. They even consulted a doctor because uh, his parents were worried about his slow verbal learning ability. But I think that slow verbal learning ability was the first clue we have to the imagination and creativity of Einstein because he did not think in words. He did not think verbally. He thought in pictures. He thought visually. He spent his time throughout his life doing what he called visual thought experiments. That's what you and I would call daydreaming, but if you're Einstein, you get to call them visual thought experiments. Um, secondly, he was very rebellious as a child. He was always defying authority, which was not exactly appreciated in the German school system of the late 19th century. So much so that one headmaster actually kicks him out of school and another amuses us by saying, this Einstein will never amount to much. But that too, that rebelliousness, that willingness to defy authority and question the prevailing wisdom, that was part of his ability to think out of the box, be more creative, and make the leaps of the imagination that I think distinguish his science. When he was a kid at age five, his father gave him a compass, for example. And he said he sat up night after night watching that compass and seeing how the needle twitched and point north. And he said it, it sent chills down his spine as he tried to visualize unseen force fields in the universe and what type of unseen force could be making that needle twitch and point north. Now, I don't know about you, but I can remember getting a compass when I was a kid, right? And you think, wow, cool, look, the needle points north. You go outside and you think, oh, look, it, wow, this is great. And then about a minute later, you're on to something else, right? You say, hey, look, a dead squirrel. And you think, oh, wow, you know, that's interesting. And you forget about the compass. For the rest of his life, until his deathbed, he is visualizing force fields and wondering what makes that needle twitch and point north. One of the myths about Einstein, which is, uh, unfortunately is a myth, he kind of wanted to be true, is that he failed math as a kid when he was a student in Germany. Uh, I say you wanted to be true because if you Google Einstein failed math, you get about 66,000 websites listed. And they say things like, as everybody knows, Einstein failed math as a kid, so maybe there's hope for me yet and stuff. In fact, he was not very good in languages, he didn't do well in French, but he did very well in math in school because he realized that he could visualize the equations, imagine them, picture them. He knew that a mathematical equation is just the good Lord's brushstroke 
for something that actually exists in physical reality. I was helping my daughter, who's 17, with her math homework about a week ago, and she'd gotten some simple equation that she had multiplied wrong. And I said, Betsy, just look at it. It's got, you know, 2x squared plus y. It's got to slope upward like that. It's got to swoop up. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, if you just look at the equation, you're supposed to visualize how it moves. And uh, she said, no, Dad, that's not how they teach math these days. <laughs> I hate to say it, but Einstein was probably smarter than my daughter at age 17, at least in math. And while, when he was 17, he was trying to visualize and picture what are known as Maxwell's equations. James Clark Maxwell had just come up with these set of equations, four major equations and other equations. And if you look at the equations of Maxwell combined and visualize them, or if you're Einstein and you look and you visualize them, something very interesting becomes apparent, which is they define a light wave or any electromagnetic wave. And if you look at the equations, the wave always has to travel at the same speed. Whether you're traveling one way or another, you're moving towards the light, away from the light, you're riding alongside the light wave, no matter what happens, the equations fit together, so the light wave always travels at a constant speed, about 186,000 miles per second. So Einstein, at age 17, is visualizing this, and he's like trying to figure out what would happen if I rode alongside a light beam. He says, what if I rode alongside the wave, and I went faster and faster, and I tried to catch up with the light wave, wouldn't the wave seem stationary to me? You know, wouldn't it, uh, wouldn't I be able to catch up with it? And it would just be stationary next to me. But Maxwell's equations don't allow for that. And he said, it caused him such anxiety that he went around for weeks on end with his palms sweating as he worried about this paradox. Now, this caused me to think of all the things that were causing my palms to sweat at age 17 when I was growing up in New Orleans. And none of them were Maxwell's equations. But that's why he's Einstein and we're not. Um, he, like my friend Benjamin Franklin, he is so frustrated by the rigid school systems, he becomes a runaway at 17. Runs away from the school, sort of gets kicked out of the school, but then leaves the German school system, goes to Italy and then to Switzerland, where he thinks he can have a more imaginative and creative education. And he applies to the second best college in Zurich, the Zurich Polytechnic. And he gets rejected. Now, those of us who are 17-year-olds who, by December 1st, have to have their applications to college in, and we're sweating this out, I've always wanted to meet the admissions director of the Zurich Polytech, who had turned down Albert Einstein. But, fortunately for his reputation, and probably fortunately for Einstein, Einstein gets in his second go-around, on his second attempt, a year later. He's able to get into the Zurich Polytech, and he does pretty well. Uh, however... His ability or his, his propensity to question authority, to challenge every statement, uh, doesn't go over well with his professors. He's able to alienate all three of the professors at the Zurich Polytech that are his main professors there by defying their authority. There's Heinrich Weber, who is the physics professor. And um, at one point, <laughs> Einstein explains to Weber the dilemma Einstein sees with Maxwell's equations, which is, couldn't you catch up with that light wave? Wouldn't it look stationary to you? And Weber says, well, I don't actually teach Maxwell's equations. They're too new. They're just a theory. At which point, Einstein quits calling him Herr Professor and starts calling him Herr Einstein. I mean, Herr, Herr, uh, Herr Weber instead of Herr Professor. And Weber considers that an insult and quits having anything to do with Einstein. There's Pernay, who's the... Um, laboratory instructor. Einstein was never a very good experimentalist, which is probably why he had to become a theorist. Uh, but at one point, Pernay gives out the instructions for doing a laboratory experiment in his class, and Einstein somewhat ostentatiously just throws them away and does the experiment in his own way. And he ends up blowing up the equipment. So Pernay puts him on academic probation for his entire senior year. And then there's Minkowski, the math instructor who teaches math by row. 
boat, doesn't sort of understand the notion of visualizing equations. So Einstein quits going to his lectures and has his friend, Marcel Grossman, take notes for him. Uh, and so we get a nice report from Professor Minkowski, one of his reports, which is, this Albert Einstein is a lazy dog, it says. Thus it is that Einstein's the only graduate of the 1900 class at the Zurich Polytech in physics and math 